Is Linux more secure than Windows? The default answer is pretty much no. The security of Linux comes from the fact it tends to be less targeted on personal computers than Windows, but on servers, it's an appetizing target. But Linux can be more secure than Windows if you want it or if you need it to. Distros always have to strike a compromise between security and usability. The more secure you make your system, the more friction you can encounter as you use it. So here are a bunch of things you can do to make your Linux server or your desktop more secure. You can pick and choose what you need and what you don't depending on your use case and your distro might already implement some of these. And of course, if you have other important tips, don't hesitate to share them in the comments so everyone can benefit. And speaking of security, there's also our sponsor. If you are interested in increasing the security of your Linux system, you should also take a broader look of everything that you use, and that includes email. That's where our sponsor ProtonMail comes in. ProtonMail is a private and secure email service. They are based in Switzerland and they are laser focused on protecting your privacy with robust end-to-end -end and zero access encryption and plenty of security features built in, like two-factor authentication, support for hardware security keys like YubiKey and support for biometric lock on their mobile apps. But on top of that, they also have Proton Sentinel. They have a team of security analysts who monitor your account 24-7 to detect suspicious account events, infiltration and takeover attempts, and it's a level of security that automated systems alone cannot match. And of course, ProtonMail remains easy to use and offers all the protections you will expect to keep your inbox clean from trackers, ads, spam and phishing. It also provides all the features you need to quickly manage your email, unsubscribe from newsletters, manage your calendar, and more. And the best part, you can sign up to ProtonMail for free and enjoy a suite of essential tools, including a VPN, calendar, secure cloud storage, and a password manager. ProtonMail's free tier gives you all the essentials and you can upgrade at any time for more storage or premium features like Proton Sentinel. So head over to the link in the description below and give ProtonMail a try. Okay, so let's begin with a general rule of thumb. The more software you use, the larger the attack surface you give to attackers. It's logical, each piece of software you install adds potential vulnerabilities and attack vectors that can be exploited. Which means you should only install and keep installed what you actually still use. It's always good to take a look at all your installed applications and libraries and remove what you don't use anymore. You can also remove packages that aren't linked to anything else and aren't used by anything. For example, on Debian or Ubuntu, you can find all of these by running sudo apt auto remove. And of course, it also means you will want to make sure everything you run is up to date. Apply your software updates. If you're coming from the Windows world, you might view software updates with a bit of distrust because they can be very annoying, they can interrupt your work, and they sort of often break things or add features and tracking that you never asked for. On Linux, this is not the case. And on a desktop, you probably already apply updates or your distro might even have auto-updates enabled. But on a server, it's easy to let things slide and to forget to log in regularly or automate things to make sure that things are up to date. I am guilty of that myself. So don't be lazy and make sure your updates are applied regularly. And just like with packages, libraries and apps, you should also make sure you only run the services you actually use. By services, I mean stuff like Cups, the printing server, or Alza for older audio programs, Bluetooth, firmware update for firmware updates, VPN services, and the like. Most distros should handle these services using systemd, and you can list all services running with systemctl list-unit-files. And of course, if when you heard the word systemd, you made a mini barf in your mouth, then maybe you already know how to handle all of these services. Now, still on system D though, to stop a service you don't need, you can run systemctl stop followed by the name of the service. You might need admin privileges here, so you might need to use sudo. To stop the service from starting with the system, you can also run systemctl disable followed by the name of the service. 
For example, most servers will not need Bluetooth or printing, so you could disable that and make sure they don't run at all times. It will also save a few system resources in the process. Get it? Process? Okay, moving on. If you run Linux on a server, the general rule of thumb is also not to run a graphical desktop on it. It will use a lot of resources for something you don't access most of the time, and it adds a lot of software that could then be used by attackers. It will often be much more secure to use SSH to log into the server remotely. But you might also need to secure SSH first. If you have multiple users, make sure only the ones who need it have SSH access. To do that, you can edit the slash etc slash SSH slash SSHD underscore config file and type allow users, then the names of the users that will actually have access to SSH. You might also want to authenticate using a public key instead of a password. The user that logs into the server with SSH will have to have a key that matches what is on the device being accessed through SSH. This is much more secure than just a password that could be brute forced. You can also turn on two-factor authentication for SSH and use an authenticator app for even more security. There are a lot of tutorials online on how to do this. I left links in the description for some of these. I would love to include them in the video, but I also don't want it to take 45 minutes and we still have a lot to cover. Now, something that might be useful in general for a server or a desktop is making sure all the users are correctly handled. The first thing will be to disable root login. Root is the super user, the one that has access to virtually everything on the system. If an attacker manages to log in as root, your system is toast. So it's better to not have root as a user, but use administrator privileges instead. Now, do note that some people think that having the root user is more secure than using sudo for every admin user because you only have one user that can do everything. And if it has a very strong password, then it's more secure. But personally, I disagree with that. The root user will always be the obvious attack choice because it has access to everything. So that's the one attackers might try to brute force into. And also admin accounts that have access to sudo, you can limit what they can actually do using sudo. So they might not have all the privileges over all the system. Now, if you do decide to disable the root account, make sure that at least one user still has full admin privileges though, or you will have a system without any way to access certain administrator tasks. Once you're certain everything is okay, you can use the following method, which will redirect root's login from bash to no login. So the root account will still be here, but it won't be able to access anything. To do so, you can edit slash etc slash password, and you can change this line by replacing slash bin slash bash or whatever other shell root currently logs into by slash sbin slash no login. Now, if you want to keep the root account locally, but you want to disable any remote access to it through SSH, you can also do that. And it's a good way to mitigate security risks without compromising the efficiency of you actually using your device. To do so, you can edit the slash etc slash SSH slash SSHD underscore config file and uncomment the permit root login line, then set its value to no restart SSH with systemctl, restart sshd, and you're done. On top of that, your regular users should have some limits in place. While you can set up password aging, as in users will have to change their passwords after a certain amount of time, I think it's generally not that great, as a lot of users might just end up writing their password down somewhere, which is obviously not secure. What you can do instead is enforcing strong passwords, with a variety of rules for length and complexity. You can set these in slash etc slash pam.d slash command dash password on Debian based systems or in slash etc slash security slash pwquality.conf on Red Hat based distros. Again, I left a link on how to do that in the description of the video because explaining all the various options and rules that you can set up would take its entire video. You can also lock users out after multiple login failures to ensure brute force attacks cannot be executed. You will need the PAM underscore fail lock module, which will probably be pre-installed on most distros. 
After that, you can edit the slash etc slash security slash faillock.conf file and add a few lines to set how many failed attempts can happen and the time before the locked account is unlocked. You can also try to improve the physical security of your device, you know, in case it gets stolen or somebody puts their greasy paws on it. So of course, full disk encryption will be pretty useful for that. Once your disk is encrypted, unless the attacker manages to guess or brute force the passphrase, they won't be able to just plug a USB drive and siphon the whole contents of your hard drive. Most distros offer an encryption option at install, just make sure to use a passphrase that you can remember, because if you lose it, you lose your files. You can also lock the BIOS with a password, so an attacker couldn't change the boot priority to boot a live USB and grab your files. This can be done in the BIOS or UEFI interface of your computer. And if your device doesn't ever need to have anything plugged into it, you can also completely disable USB and Thunderbolt in your Linux system. So even if someone manages to get in the system and access your account, they won't be able to just grab a USB drive and copy stuff. Although, admittedly, if they have access to your session, they could also just zip the whole files that they need and send them over using the internet, even using the command line. Now, still, if you want to disable that, you can type the commands I left in the description of the video for USB, Firewire, and Thunderbolt. To revert this, just remove the lines that have been added in the various files by these commands. And finally, we have two more big topics. The first one is the firewall. Most distributions come with a firewall installed, like Firewall D or UFW for uncomplicated firewall. But it's often not configured or not even enabled. Firewalls are an entire separate topic and you will have to know which protocols and which ports you need to open or close depending on what your devices do. So I can't really cover it in here. If you want to see a video on how to configure your firewall for various use cases, drop me a comment in the description below and I'll see what I can do. Now, if you need a graphical user interface to explore what these firewalls can do, uh, you can get one. There's GUFW for uncomplicated firewall, it's in the Ubuntu repos, and for Fedora or Red Hat based distros, you have firewall config to configure firewall D. The second big topic is SE Linux or App Armor, depending on the distro. Both are what we call mandatory access control systems, and they let you grant or deny access to various resources and systems in the Linux kernel. Basically, they let you create security profiles or policies that apply to various things that you can do on your system. App Armor is generally used on Ubuntu and Debian based distros, and SE Linux is a Red Hat thing, so mostly used on Red Hat based distros. They do work in very different ways, but they do try to accomplish the same goal. They are pretty complicated, and again, they would require their own videos because they are completely use case dependent. Now, what you need to know is that SE Linux is more complex and has a steeper learning curve but it is generally considered a more secure option because it supports multi-level security, which App Armor doesn't. App Armor, on the other hand, is much simpler to set up and to use and to understand, but since it creates security profiles based on file paths, you have to duplicate profiles for certain apps that can have multiple paths to access them, which creates potential vulnerabilities. And also it tends to take longer to start than SE Linux. As I said, these are pretty complex tools that are really, really dependent on your use case, what you want to do, how many users have access to your device, and what the role of the device is. So again, if you want a dedicated video on these tools, drop me a comment and I'll see what I can do. And so this will do for this video, a bunch of quick tips and tricks to improve the default security of your Linux install. Depending on how well the video does, I might dive deeper into various topics like configuring the firewall, app armor, SE Linux. Let me know if you'd like to see this on the channel. There are plenty of other things you can do as well, like setting disk quotas for users, configuring kernel parameters, setting up logging and audits to detect weird behaviors or intrusions. And you can also secure various parts of a server, like Apache, PHP, Nginx, and more. But of course, I can't cover everything in one single video. It's long enough as it is. 
Depending on the use case, the device, its physical location, how many people have access to it and your threat model, there are plenty of things you can do to make Linux more secure than it already is and more secure than most other operating systems. Do remember to back up your system before applying any major change though, because if you break something, you'll be very happy to have a full system backup to go back to. And just making backups is a general good rule for security and for peace of mind. And if you want peace of mind when buying a new computer and running Linux on it, then there's our sponsor, Tuxedo. They make laptops and desktops that run Linux out of the box. The hardware is picked specifically inside these devices because it works well with Linux. And generally they have submitted patches upstream to make sure that everything that they pack in is supported well and so everybody can benefit, not just them on their devices. Whatever your needs and the price point you have, they're gonna have something to match that. Whether it's an affordable laptop, a NUC, a tower, something for gaming, something for office, uh, something super powerful for video editing or 3D modeling, they have it all. And all their devices are very customizable with your own custom keyboard layout on the keyboards of your laptop if you want, your own custom logo on the lid of your laptop. You have a nice big selection of components you can pick. You can select from a variety of distros to have pre-installed or you can just install your own. And also all their laptops can be opened, repaired and upgraded, including the RAM, the SSD, the battery and sometimes the wireless card. So if you need a new computer and you want to run Linux on it and you want to support Linux's development, click the link in the description below and get yourself a device from Tuxedo. They're really good. So thanks everyone for watching the video. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, you know what to do. There's a like button, a big bell that you can ring, a subscribe button, a comment section where you can tell me everything you want. And if you didn't like it, there's always that thumbs down button and the comment section as well. And if you really enjoy the channel and you want to support it, there are plenty of links in the description for virtually any system you want to use to contribute. So you know what to do. Thanks for watching and I guess you'll see me in the next one. Bye!